Okay, what I'd like to do is I'd like to try a simple problem. I'd like to look at a physical pendulum here, which is made of a rod that moves its fastest at the bottom with some angular speed w, and I want to figure out its maximum angular deflection. So let's start that off by sort of drawing a picture. Um, obviously, I'm still not extra good drawing things on this computer. Uh, let's see, we've got our bar there, got some angular speed omega going on, and we'd like to figure out how high it goes, right? We'd like to figure out how high it goes. So let's see, it goes up to some maximum up here. Um, that's going to give us our angle theta. And we know a couple of things about the bar. This is length L, and we know it's mass. So let's just go ahead and start talking about it. We know we've got this rod, we've got this bar. Um, it has a mass M and a length L. Okay, and it's got this um, initial angular speed. Omega. Okay, that's its angular speed at the bottom there. And we want to find its maximum deflection. Theta. Okay, so we've got almost everything we really need. Uh, we might want to think about a couple of things. One of them is, where is the center of mass of each of these bars, because that's what's actually moving, and how high does that center of mass actually travel up? And we'd like to consider that because the way we're going to actually solve this is conservation of energy. Conserve this energy. Um, an equation that would go along with that would be Ki plus Ui, the initial and um, the initial kinetic and potential energy is sum, and that sum is equal to the sum of the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy, okay? So we've got those things. We're almost completely prepared. After preparation, we'll do plan. After plan, we'll execute. After execute, we'll check. But first, we need to finish up with a representation. So it's a tiny bit early. It's a tad bit early for worrying about extended body diagrams, but we'll start with it now anyway. So what we want to do with these extended body diagrams is uh, have our large thing, um, have our pivot. Uh, probably the best thing would be to put the axes along here. Our axes probably should be um, in the tangential and normal directions. All right, and we need to add some extra stuff on there. We need to add some sort of things like, say, the weight. The weight is applied at the center of mass, which is way down here. And we also have a pivot force, a force on the pivot. It's not a pivot force, but it's a force from the pivot that keeps the thing from moving um, from this point, around this point. It can move around that point, but this point has to stay there all the time. Okay, and what else do we need for this free body diagram? Well, always for a free body diagram, we need to figure out where the net force is. And the net force is going to be somewhere between these two forces. And in fact, it probably should be in between here because this is turning around, right? So it's so the center of mass has got an inward pointing um, net force in the normal direction. And it's got a, it's got a um, net force going down. It's got a force going this way, speeding up or slowing it down, if it's on this side of the, it's on this side of this line. So our net force should have these two components, and and this is an mac for turning. This is an mat for speeding up. So tangential speeds up and slows down. Centripetal turns.
All right, that's how all those things go together. This obviously should go in here, but you can tell that there's no way with this pen on this screen, I'm going to make that drawing in that tiny little space. So we're ready for starting our plan now. All right. Now we're going to start our plan the way we always start our plan, which is with theta, right? Theta is what we want here. So we're going to have to figure out what that is. And we want to do it in such a way that we can get the conservation of energy out. And the conservation of energy is going to use this H, right? It's going to use how high this bar has raised above its original spot. The center of mass of the bar has raised. So that means we're going to draw a triangle. So we've got an L over 2 here. And if this is going in a circle, that's an L over 2 there. Yeah, but this spot here is our H, right? Coming from here to here. So that's our H, probably deserves a different color for being H. So that's our H right there, okay? And so we need to find something that has to do with um, this line here. Well, if we've already called this angle theta, then we can find find this side here through trigonometry. Trigonometry tells us that you know this is the adjacent um, side to this angle, so this guy is L over two cosine theta, and therefore H is going to be this whole bar here L over two minus L over 2 cosine theta, which also means that, you know, 1 minus cosine theta is equal to 2H over L. That's good. And so if we look at this, cosine theta is also equal to 1 minus uh, 2H over L. So from trigonometry, the first equation in our plan uh, cosine theta is equal to, um, what is that, 1 minus 2h over L. Good so far. Good so far. 2, well, now that we've got an equation for this, right, and we know this, but we don't know this H. There's a big question mark there. We don't know that H. So we want to find an equation for that H, right? That's our next plan. So what goes in there? Um, well, I was just saying that we wanted this H for the potential energy. So we can probably use conservation of energy. to give us a equation, to give us an equation, excuse my English, that'll be correct, all right? So if we look at our conservation of energy equation over here, we've got some nice things about it. Down here at the bottom, at the initial spot, we can define our potential energy to be zero. At the top spot, the bar stops moving, so if it's not moving at all, then its final kinetic energy is zero, right? So then we have just Ki is equal to Uf. Ki is going to be the rotational kinetic energy of the bar, so that's one-half I omega squared, where omega is this guy here. That's going to be equal to the potential energy. It's going to be equal to the potential energy when the bar is up here, which is mgh, right? We're looking for that h. m we know. Uh, g we're okay with, because it's a universal constant. We're allowed to use that in our solution. Let's see, universal constants are fine. And materials constants are fine as well. Um, i, we don't know. We don't know that i. 
but we're okay with the omega because the omega's here. So we've got the omega, we've got the m, so everything's fine except for that i. So we just have to, three, find the moment of inertia. This particular moment of inertia you may have in your book, you may not, it depends on your book. That's fine. Um, so just kind of figure out whether or not you have it. I'm just going to pretend like all I know is the moment of inertia around a center of mass. I can look that up, right? That's simple enough for a bar. That's 1 12th ml squared for the center of mass. Um, but for the displacement, I have to use the parallel axis theorem. means I add in the I add in the moment of inertia from the pivot being up here instead of down here. So this L over 2 deflection or displacement. So that's going to be the mass times whatever that displacement is, which is L over 2 squared. I know the mass, I know L over 2, or I know L. So I know all of those things, and I was looking for the I. So I'm actually done. I've got all the equations I need to solve the problem. So the next thing is, is to solve the problem, right? All we have to do is sort of solve the problem, and we are done. So let us see. Let us see. Uh, the way to solve it, uh, most likely is to start with our conservation of energy, right, and find H, right? So if I'm using my conservation of energy and I'm finding H, all I have to do is divide by mg, right? So I have I omega squared, moment of inertia times the fastest speed of the object, divided by twice the mass times the gravitational acceleration. Okay, So we're okay with that. That's pretty good. Um, that's just a division. Next, we want to sort of substitute in that i. So we take 3 and we substitute in that i. That i is going to be equal to 1 third ml squared. Right. So we therefore have 1 3 times 2 is 6 ml squared omega squared over mg. Obviously, we can get rid of the m. So we have L squared omega squared over g times 1 sixth. So we're pretty good with that. So then all we have to do is bring this down and substitute the h into it. Right? Solving for cosine theta is fine because uh, it's basically unique. If we, if we have what we have, we have it. And so we have 1 minus h, which is L squared omega squared over 6g divided by L over 2. So we cancel those out. Those are 3s. That's a 3. We cancel that guy out there, and we have 1 minus omega squared L over 3G. So that is our answer. That's going to be the maximum uh, angular deflection. The angle whose cosine is this number. So it's 3G minus omega squared L over 3G. All right, so if that's going to be our maximum thing, we're done with it. All we have to do is check it. So first thing we want to do is go through here. What we can do is just check these symbols. We've got an omega. Omega is given. So omega goes in the given. We've got an L. L is given, so it goes here, and G is here. 
So it's a universal constant. Um, so all of those things together give us a fairly good, a fairly good um, idea that at least we've got our symbols right. We haven't left out anything. We haven't left out any steps or equations or anything like that in our process. So that's fairly good right there. Next, we have to check reasonableness or the dimensions. It's not purely reasonableness. So how would we check how reasonable or the dimensions of this thing? Well, basically, this is where the dimensional homogeneity comes in, right? So cosine theta has dimensions of one, one has dimensions of one. So the only place where the dimensional homogeneity can fail is if this product here, omega squared L over G, does not have units of one, right? If it does not, if it's not unitless. So this thing has to be unitless. We want dimensions of one. I give the big slate here, of course, for, well, for two reasons. One is to prevent you from looking at the process because we don't care about the process. We only care about the answer when we're talking about is the answer reasonable. Uh, the other thing is, is, you know, I want to have room to actually do this. And as you can tell, my writing is fairly large on this thing. So now we've got this omega squared L over G. We don't need the three because we know uh, three is un unitless, so it doesn't do anything interesting for us. Um, so those units are the units of omega squared times the units of the length L times the units of the acceleration G to the minus one. Uh, omega has units of T to the minus one. It's an angular speed and that is squared. L has units of L, and G has units of L, T to the minus 2, okay? So we have, and that's to the minus 1, so we have T squared, and we have T to the minus 2 here, so those guys cancel, and the L and L to the minus 1, those cancel, so everything works out 1. So we are correct. The, um, the dimensions, at least, are correct the symbols are correct. Um, so that seems all fairly reasonable to me, okay? So uh, I think we're okay with this. I think this will do for now. I will do this in another way, the approximate way, at the end of the next video I put up. I'm just going to do that to show you why it's not always, it's not always good to use that particular method. Uh, the reason why I want to do that is because you can get the right answer. You can get this answer using that method if you use the right approximations. If you don't use the right approximations, then when uh, theta is large, the answer you get from the other method deviates. It should be too large, I think. Um, the cosine of the angle is going to be too large, which means the angle might be too small. In any event, I will do that at the end of the next one. The next one will actually have another point. Um, and there's actually another point in there, too, uh, that's important. But uh, that that's going to have to do with the angular speed versus, versus the angular frequency. Two completely different things. Completely different. They show up in each other's expressions, but they're completely different things. So... We will talk about that next time, the next video I put up. Right now, just be happy with this and uh, make sure you understand it. And hopefully you'll see something like it again. All right. Thanks now. I'll see you in class. Bye.